Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings to the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are now in a little poem, Warble for Lilac Time. This is poem number 11 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. We pointed out already that autumn representing that which is kind of older and rivulets that which is newer or the source. And uh, we're going we're gonna to play that game here. Some have argued this may be one of Whitman's most successful short lyric poems. I'm going to Leave it to you to kind of decide that. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, and that you've been with us from the very beginning, the opening word come. We're going to see that word here in this poem again. Um, through all the inscription poems, we gave a, uh, a, a set of comments on when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, and we'll come back to some of that. Um, Heart-shaped leaves and all of that. We gave a set of introductory comments for autumn rivulets, and we just finished with Singer in Prison. Now, our Nortons will tell us about this poem for background information that it was first published in the Galaxy in May 1870. Note the date of May to spring. It was reprinted with concurrent slight revisions in Passage to India in 1871, in the Daily Graphic of May 12, 1873, and in Passage to India Group of Leaves of Grass 1872, and, uh, and, and then with eight lines cancel in its present form in Lisa Grass 1881. One of Whitman's, Norton's calls it, one of Whitman's most successful lyrics, this jocund and sparkling spring song also suggests the emotional range of the lilac symbol. And of course, we already saw this range when we were playing around with when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom. Notice we'll begin with the word warble. Uh, you'll remember this from Splendid Silent Sun, as well as obviously Lilac's last uh, I I passage, number 10. How shall I warble for the dead one that I loved, right? Now, well, I like time, obviously, is spring, and this is one of the great poems, a celebration of spring. Let's read and annotate, and, and, and that will allow us to be able to uh, appreciate his celebration. I love to read this poem out loud. This is one of those poems that you take your children to the park, and when they're swinging, you read it out loud because it's just so much fun. And we will see a few exclamation points. We'll see, pick up five of them later in the poem. But it's almost as if there could be an exclamation point at the end of every one of these lines. Warble me now for joy of lilac time, and then in parenthetics, returning in reminiscence. You'll remember this word reminiscence from the previous poem, uh, Prison, as well as it'll come back again. I think this is um, one of the keys to all great artists, is that they're always calling us to be reminded, to not forget that there is this amazing thing called our lives, and we should celebrate it, especially in the spring we're reminded, right? Sort me, O oh, tongue and lips, for nature's sake. Notice nature's capitalized. Thanks, it makes us think, of course, of, of Emerson's classic essay that we've talked about at LearnStrong.net. Souvenirs of earliest summer. I love this use of the word souvenirs here. Gather the welcome signs. And again, great artists are always pointing us towards the signs. And then in parenthetics, as children with pebbles are stringing shells. Stringing shells is used only one time in all these of grass, and it's right here. It's a great word picture. In other words, these memories get picked up and put on a string. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of Buddhist uh, representation that's going on here as well. Put in April and May, we're obviously in the spring, the highest croaking in the ponds, obviously this is the bright green frogs. By the way, only one time used in all these of grass, and it's right here. And it takes us back to a story about Whitman teaching his young students. I'll remind you that Whitman was a teacher at a one-room schoolyard, and they were out there in the yard lying in the grass studying frogs, and they were asked, uh, Whitman was asked by the school um, uh, administrator, we just bought you brand new books with drawings of frogs. Why are you not just looking at the book? And he, and he obviously challenged them by saying, I'd much, rather, I'd much rather teach my students direct experience of the frogs. Now notice all the threes. There's lots of trinities in this. It makes this poem so remarkable. Bees, butterflies, the sparrow with its simple notes. Notice all the bird references. Bluebird and darting swallow, nor forget the high hole flashing his golden wings. And now the tranquil, hazy sun. It's fun, it's fun to read this poem with the, with, the, with the lyrical rhythms. The clinging smoke, the vapor, back to more threes. Shimmer of waters with fish in them takes us back to uh, there was a child went forth. Um, the uh, cerulean uh, above, we, we saw, heard this word, that beautiful blue um, in uh, men of warbird and a delicate cluster. All that is jocund and sparkling, this word jocund takes us uh, to return of the heroes, passage seven, obviously takes us to our Homer. It's the, it's the word of the poem that most is Homeric, right? And sparkling, the brooks running. The maple woods, 
The crisp February days and the sugar making makes us immediately think of Thoreau's Walden. We've given full lectures on that as well at LearnStrong.net. The robin where he hops, bright-eyed, brown-breasted, again all the birds, with musical clear call at sunrise and again at sunset. We're going to think of Shelley, obviously to Skylark. We're going to think of Shelley, Ode to the West Wind, If Winter Come Can Spring Be Far Behind. That stands, I believe, so much behind this. Or flitting among the trees of the apple orchard, building the nest of his mate, obviously makes us think of Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking. The melted snow of March. The willow. Now we're to trees. Sending forth its yellow-green sprouts. It's miraculous, isn't it? The spring every year is miraculous for us, right? For springtime is here, the summer is here. Springtime, by the way, um, is only used one time in laser grass this way, and it's right here. Springtime is here, the summer is here. And what is this in it and from it? It's an amazing rhetorical question. All you got to do is study the seasons to know a whole lot about life. That's what Emerson said, of course, in his, in his classic essay, Nature, and, and it's here as well. It's obviously Thoreau's Walden. Thou soul unloosened, and then the dash, the, res the restlessness after I know not what. It, it, the spring. It's, I, I, some of you have said, I'm not exactly sure why I'm doing this study of Talks with Walt with you, and I'm reading all these poems of Leaves of Grass in, in, in order, the death edition, but there's a certain kind of intellectual restlessness. And in the spring, we definitely find ourselves tapping into that, don't we? It's, it's kind of almost natural. And then the use of the word come. I told you when we began our studies together, that very first word in the very, at the very beginning, right? And here it is again. Come, let us lag here no longer. Now that's interesting because at the beginning of Song of Myself 1, he's going to lay, he's going to lounge, he's going to look at a spear of summer grass. But now he's going to say no more lagging, right? Let us be up and away. Now he's going to use bird imagery and notice he's going to continue with his uh, exclamation points. Oh, if one could but fly like a bird. Again, we're back to um, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, especially passages four and five. We've given full lectures on Shelley's Skylark as well as uh, Ode, to, uh, um, Ode to the West Wind at LearnStrong.net. You can run that to ground. Oh, to escape, to sail forth as in a ship. Now, obviously, that takes us to Homer and the Odyssey, but I want you to jot down at 3A because we're going to pick up with it those final lines from Passage to India. When we meet that poem, we'll come back to this idea of sailing. We've seen already sailing a number of times in Lisograss is that indicator of taking the voyage, taking the journey, right? And then he continues. To glide with thee, O soul, or all, in all, as a ship or the waters. Gathering these hints, obviously we've heard this word before in Leaves of Grass, the preludes, the musical language, the blue sky, we saw Cerulean earlier, and then of course there it is, the grass. I told you guys, I think Whitman is having the best of fun as he is playing the game in Leaves of Grass, and here it is of course, the grass, the morning drops of dew, the lilac scent, the bushes with dark green heart-shaped leaves, back to when lilacs last in the dooryard room. Wood violets, the little delicate, he likes to stack these adjectives, obviously delicate and little easily go together. The little delicate pale blossoms called innocence, samples and sorts not for themselves alone, but for their atmosphere. In other words, all of nature is singing joyously about this, what he calls grace. To grace the bush I love. Now, you'll remember grace was used in Song of Myself, Passage 45, Ineffable Grace of Dying Days. He loves this, use, this type of use of the word. And then the dash, to sing with the birds. We obviously think of you know, the famous Francis of Assisi sermon in regards to the birds, right? <clears throat> A warble, just back now to the opening lines, of joy of lilac time returning in reminiscence. So for Whitman, this is one of those great poems of celebration of the spring. And when you are in need of a poem to celebrate the spring, this is one of those perfect poems. At 2A, well, obviously here the great symbolism is life is always about returning. Rivulets, right? Always returning. Back, the river runs to the sea and all of that. The seasons, the power of the seasons. Uh, at 2B, I love the rhythms of this poem. Just take it out and read it uh, nonstop. We obviously, you know, exegeted as we read, but it's quite compelling to, to just read out loud. It's wonderful. We've mentioned in 3A the great work of Shelley. I've said this to you guys many times. Shelley stands behind a whole lot of the project of Leaves of Grass as a sustained theodicy, as we have called it. No longer ask, why is this happening to me, but rather, why is this happening for me. Spring is the time when so much of that can be understood. Why do we got to go through the wretched winter? Because spring is coming. And of course, if winter come, can spring be far behind? Is the final lines 
of that fifth passage of, of Ode to the West Wind. Finally, of course, the question of all questions to own a poem like this is, what are your own thoughts about spring? Do you, in fact, always see spring as the, the great exemplar of resurrection, the phoenix bird, and, of course, dare we say it now, leaves of grass? Thank you.